Hi everyone, I am Jessica Fontaine and I am the director of Storoton Village Museum. Um, welcome to our second part of our Juneteenth speaker series, Land Ownership, Generational Wealth and Inequality. Storoton Village is a department of the Eastern States Exposition, home of the Big E Fair. ESE is a not-for-profit organization committed to agriculture, education, industry, family entertainment, and preservation of New England history. We're grateful for your participation today, whether virtually or in person. I'm just gonna let somebody else in here. Okay. Today we have people in person at our summer solstice celebration event, and they may also join us in person to watch our lecture, which we have up on a large screen for everyone to see while they're here. This lecture is recorded and available for viewing on our website, storotonvillage.com. It'll be up on Monday if anyone is looking for that and also posted on our social media. We want to thank Springfield Technical Community College for their assistance in publicizing this event and especially Vanetta Lightfoot, operations manager from the Stick Multicultural Affairs Department for enthusiastically supporting this new collaboration with us. I'd now like to introduce our moderator for this panel discussion, J. Anthony Guillory, PhD, teaches courses at Springfield Technical Community College in American history, African American history, and African American literature. Guillory's first dissertation project explores the development of physical culture initiatives within African American communal spaces along the East Coast between 1900 and 1920. Guillory's service work goal is to empower communities through informed engagement. Guillory currently resides in Dallas, Texas after 10 years in Massachusetts and continues as a professor of English and history while also earning a second doctoral degree at the University of Texas at Arlington. In just a moment, Dr. Guillory will also introduce you to our panelists. We ask that everyone remain on mute during the discussion. However, we will open up for questions at the end or as uh, Anthony is looking for additional questions. If you have any questions during the presentation, we'll be monitoring the chat box. Um, thank you and welcome to Dr. Guillory. Thank you, I appreciate that so much. Um, thank you all for uh, tuning in or for um, for those of you who are on the ground, thank you for attending. Um, it is my absolute pleasure <clears throat> to present uh, or to uh, introduce you to uh, our two presenters, um, my former colleague, uh, or I should say my, because we're still working together, but my colleague, John Diffley, uh, who was my office mate for six years um, at Springfield Technical Community College. Um, and uh, Nidra Lee, who is a new acquaintance introduced to me by a uh, mutual colleague. Um, both of them are residing there in New England. Both of them are um, experts in their respective uh, areas on the impact of um, race and um, law and um, the historical implications thereof. Um, the theme for today's talk uh, is a critical one for me um, because it is in line with one of the things that we think about when we think about Juneteenth, which is uh, the significance of land um, as an economic entity, right? Generational wealth and inequality, right? Um, as we you know, celebrate the holiday in you know the various ways that we do. As we are thinking about ways to create uh, a more socially and economically just America for all people, right? It's uh, significant, right, and important to think about uh, the implications of Juneteenth, right, um, for the people on the ground at the time, and the ways in which they thought about their definitions of freedom and their definitions of citizenship in their definitions of self-determination. Um, the order of the presentation will be John Diffley and then Nidra Lee, uh, followed by uh, a Q&A session. I will prepare um, 
a couple of questions for each of our presenters, and then I will open up the floor for questions either from uh, the audience in attendance um, or, and, or, or those uh, who are uh, tuning in virtually. Um, when I introduce John Diffley, I'm going to turn my screen uh, black so that I'm not the focus of attention. Um, but um, if you have any questions or you have anything that you want to, uh, to share, please share it in the chat and we will address it uh, at the um, at the end uh, when the following the the, the conclusion of the presentations, okay. Um, John Diffley <clears throat> is professor of history at Springfield Technical Community College. He also serves as the coordinator for both the Liberal Arts General Studies Program, uh, as well as the Commonwealth Honors Program at STIC. Uh, John earned his Master's of Arts in History. Uh, and an advanced certificate in public history from UMass Amherst. John also earned a Juris Doctorate or a law degree from Western New England University School of Law. He is admitted to practice law in the state of Massachusetts. John will be speaking from the perspective of legal history today. <clears throat> Nidra Lee examines the intersection of race and class in the lives of African Americans during the late 19th century and uh, or late 19th and early 20th centuries. Although her research currently focuses on the United States South, particularly Central Texas, she has a burgeoning interest in the archaeology of New England. She has received funding from the Andrew, Mellon, uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the Texas Historical Commission, and has previously worked for the Smithsonian Institute Libraries and the City Museum of Washington, D.C. Again, the first voice you'll hear is, our uh, first presentation you'll hear is that of John Diffley, followed by Nidra Lee. Thank you both. All right. uh, thank you, Anthony, and thank you for uh, including me in this. It's an honor and uh, a privilege to be doing this. I always love working with you, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with uh, Nidra here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a few things here, uh, starting with the Homestead Act, um, uh, just a bit of an overview, but uh, talking about the uh, where the wealth gap uh, comes from, uh, the intersection of real estate law and even um, estate planning and how that's impacted uh, the uh, wealth gap and continues to this day, and also about some government policies uh, in the 20th century um, and beyond and, and uh, uh, similar issues. So, I mean, just as an overview, Today, African Americans face an astounding wealth gap with not just white citizens, but uh, the rest of the country today. I mean, uh, um, recent uh, data from the Federal Reserve Bank uh, and other show that uh, African Americans have anywhere from uh, 10 to 13 cents compared to one dollar uh, for a white household there. So, I mean, that's a tenth at most, uh, right, as a uh, uh, the wealth gap. And this is a, a wealth gap that just continues to grow. It's seemingly unchanged in the past at least quarter century, maybe longer. Um, and it's something that is going to grow. It's not something that seems that it can just fix itself, right? Uh, no matter what, the, the, the gap has been created and perpetuated and continues. Um, and so, and I'm going to uh, try to show, it, it comes from <clears throat> government policies and others, federal, state, local, and that. Um, <clears throat> you know, com uh, on top of all that, we're also going to say uh, there's also historical racism, uh, uh, racial terrorism, and others that have just continued, that often continue to this day, that continue to uh, make this uh, uh, this gap even bigger uh, going forward. Um, as you know, the talk is about is about the Homestead Act, and so uh, the Homestead Act is often looked at in American history as this almost um, uh, you know venerated uh, act where it opened up uh, you know over 275 million acres of land in the Western United States and elsewhere uh, to settlers. Um, you know, one note uh, to, to note too is where did that land come from? So a lot of this land that is gonna be given away was also taken from it was once Native American land, but that, that's a talk for another time as well. But uh, what the Homestead Act did was passed in 1862, it goes into effect January 1st, 1863, same day as the Emancipation Proclamation, um, Intriguingly, uh, this provided virtually free land uh, for settlers. Uh, I say virtually because there were filing fees and things like that, which could be a barrier, but in, in essence, it, it's nearly free land. Up to 160 acres of land for anybody who can claim it, improve it, and live it upon it uh, for five years. Uh, they can get the, then afterwards they could apply and get the, uh, what they used to call the patent or the title uh, to this land. Um, we're gonna see, even though the law on its face seemed race neutral, right? It never said that this is only for white citizens or, or, or uh, uh, you know, or blacks are excluded, African-Americans are excluded. It's <laughs> some of the wording in it. Um, when it was passed in 1862, uh, the way it is, uh, it was 
actually, uh, you know, administrated really did put up a significant roadblocks to African Americans uh, to fully take advantage of this. I mean, one, just thinking about it, if, it, if it's passed, it goes into effect 1863, a significant portion, uh, majority of the African American population in the U.S. at that point is still slaves. They are considered property, so they, they don't even have a chance to go out and get this property, but that's just not, uh, one of them. You know, it's not until the one thing in there, uh, the law said that it was open to anyone who was a citizen of the United States or who intended to be in a citizen of the United States. So that meant really for immigrants and that, you know, it's not until the 14th Amendment that African-Americans are fully considered, you know, at least on paper, uh, uh, citizens of the U.S. So right there, there's already a disadvantage of uh, they are excluded, even though the race is not uh, in the language uh, of it. <laughs> and as uh, Dr. Guillory, uh, Anthony pointed out this morning in his talk, you know, even when you have laws on the books where, where it seems like they could be open uh, to others, it's all about enforcement, right? If there's no one on the ground helping, no one actually enforcing these, um, it doesn't matter what it says on paper. And so that is going to be um, an issue. Um, but now why is this so important? Uh, you know, <laughs> it looks like with all this land, uh, some of the, um, in 2000, they did an estimate of this where upwards of 46 million people today uh, can trace their uh, land holdings, their families back to, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, to the Homestead Act. I mean, this is the equivalent of anywhere up to $1.6 trillion worth of uh, wealth. Um, uh, so going all the way back there, that's how much it could grow. Um, <laughs> there is, uh, you, you, and one of the issues here we're going to see is that uh, overall, maybe 1% of those people who are able to take advantage of this are African Americans. So that already is going to give a, a disadvantage. As uh, uh, Anthony mentioned, land is not just about you know, owning the property, it's all the wealth that can be generated from it, uh, extracting from the land, uh, uh, passing it on, selling it to invest in other things. Um, this is, think about that then, if African Americans have been excluded from this for, you know, what are we up to, five generations, four or five generations from that, if not more, that's a lot of time um, where this wealth is just going to compound, like uh, compound interest and grow and grow and grow. And is uh, African Americans are unfortunately going to be uh, kept out of this in many ways. Um, so, you know, large issues uh, with the Homestead Act for African Americans. We want to note that a lot of uh, people were slaves. They couldn't uh, uh, take advantage of this. But even when they could, even after emancipation and after uh, freedom, uh, just because they, the law was there didn't mean they could just easily go get it. Now, think about this. To go, uh, you know, claim this land is one thing. Well, you're going to have to get there. You're going to need supplies to turn this into um, usable land. How can people who were, you know, were denied the right to have any uh, wealth in any way, how could they even uh, take advantage of this, right? Uh, you know, some of the land we're going to see in the, and there were attempts to fix this. The Southern Homestead Act, as it's often called in 1866, uh, opened up land in five states across the South, uh, 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 intended for African Americans. Um, but even then, this land wasn't uh, exactly, you know, you couldn't just go on and farm. It was going to take a fortune anywhere from, you know, in the uh, late 19th century money up to $1,000 would literally be a fortune uh, to just to clear this land. But then you also got to think about what are they going to do in the meantime? If they're uh, farmers, uh, you know, what crops are they going to have to grow? You're going to need that money to support yourself, uh, to buy equipment, uh, to buy all that. So that's at a disadvantage. And then when they could get loans, it was often predatory, uh, predatory loaning, uh, things like that. Um, other issues, too is, you know, you had the Freedmen's Bureau and the Emancipation Proclamation saying that uh, uh, former slaves should stay as wage laborers, right? Often they were forced into these year-long labor contracts um, or more to avoid vagrancy, which is uh, something uh, Anthony had talked about earlier today as well. So even then, uh, they're not all, always able to leave to be able to take uh, care of this. Um, and even with the Southern Homestead Act, in the first year of it, it was really only open to, uh, at, well, mostly to African-Americans, those who had fought against the United States or anything like that in the Civil War were denied it, um, but that has quickly changed afterwards. So even in that sort of, um, that one year exclusive period, many uh, many former slaves were uh, locked into year long contracts. So they can't even get out of them in when even they, when you had this period uh, where they could get to it. Um, and even when they did, uh, they're defeated by extreme, po uh, uh, extreme poverty. <clears throat> um, they were defeated by opposition from white um, uh, Southerners who, uh, you know, in some places, straight out outlawed uh, uh, African-Americans from owning property and others. Uh, war, relentless war of intimidation, uh, violence, oppression. Um, so even right there, there is just a massive amount of roadblocks um, to that. And again, this is a massive amount of uh, wealth. I mean, imagine that 160 acres, how that could be divided, you know, over time uh, later. That could be divided and sold. They could be passed on to uh, other family members and, and others, for, again, from generation to generation to generation. So um, one of the other points in all this is, 
you know, because there were many African-Americans who were still able to overcome these ob obstacles, get away from it, and be able to actually gain some land out there. Um, and as Dr. Lee's uh, work notes, and I, I did look at your work there too, um, many uh, times they would go out and uh, band together, form these independent uh, communities, uh, oftentimes uh, called uh, uh, freedmen colonies or, or free freedom colonies and that, where uh, they would band together with their money uh, for safety, for security, to uh, own this property. And that's where you begin to get some of these issues where it, it goes into real estate law and uh, estate planning and, and massive amount of African-American land loss. Um, you know, one example of this is, you know, of course, the 20th century for some things I'm gonna talk about here, these uh, concepts of partition sales and intestacy, right? So uh, dying without a will. Um, and that has led to at least a million acres of land being lost by African-Americans as a result of this, uh, just in, in the 20th century alone. It, it's it, arguably, it's probably even more than that. But so just to get into some of this uh, real estate law here, one of the things that uh, African-Americans um, uh, faced with all this was a, um, it will even today, and this has been the case for much of US history, uh, African-Americans have a double the rate of intestacy uh, uh, than white Americans. And what does that mean? Again, with dying without a will, right? Of how you want to dispose of your property afterwards. Um, so how you could direct it and all that. I mean, even today, it's 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 viewed about African-Americans at um, latest numbers I saw, maybe only 20% uh, have a will uh, to, to, you know, to determine what's going to happen to their uh, property afterwards. Now, why does this become a problem? Well, when you uh, when you pass without a will, um, your your property goes uh, to your survivors, right, to your heirs, and it creates a new um, sort of uh, ownership uh, here. What is often called a tenancy or com in common or a joint tenancy. Um, again, some of the legalese and all this. What that means is you have co um, uh, co owners, right, at the same time, concurrent owners, all owning a share of this property, um, and that. Now, this becomes an issue when uh, for a couple of ways um, is. Each time this happens, every generation that this passes, you just greatly expand the number of people who have a claim to this land. And as we're going to see, as some of these laws that what are known as a partition sale um, or a partition action, <clears throat> one, any one person for any reason can get into this and force a sale of that property. And we're going to see um, how this was used. Now, an interesting partition sale uh, law and partition law comes from to go back all the way to 15th century England, well, what the idea was when you had uh, these uh, concurrent owners, when they couldn't agree what to do with the property, uh, in England, they got uh, the statutory right to uh, divide the land. And so this would be known as a partition of kind. What they would do is divide it equally, equally economic, uh, uh, useful land. This is very agricultural at the time. And so that both people at least get something out of it, right, rather than having to uh, share it there. And this continued, U.S. law comes from English law and especially through the colonies. So this passed down to us and we still have these laws. In Massachusetts, we still have these laws, uh, uh, partition and common partition sales are still used to this day. Um, but uh, again, handed down uh, through the legal history is the preference was for a partition in kind, which again would be a division of the land, right? So now everybody's getting a part of it, uh, can use it as they see fit there. What begins to happen or uh, shortly after the Civil War, actually a little bit before and, and, and then continuing to this day, is a shift in what there uh, was. You know, up until this point, it had always been a partition in kind. Um, in real estate law, the view was it was you know, wholly unjust to force the sale of someone's land, right? To take that from them. Land is a uh, basis of wealth, uh, basis, basis of citizenship, um, of status, of, uh, you know, and, and again, to be able to build a family from it. Um, <clears throat> what begins to happen, though, is the courts in the United States begin to go towards this partition sale, where, again, they force the sale of the land. Now, what does that mean, a forced sale of this? It means literally all one person out of all these, you can have 10 people as co current owners, only one of them can petition the court and demand that the land be sold, right? And so it goes to an auction here is really how this land is sold. Now, you know, if you're forced to sell something, you're always going to get a lower, uh, um, you're going to you're going to sell it for less than it's worth, right? Because it is a forced sale, uh, right? If you're selling property today, say you yeah, have land, you don't uh, like the price you're getting for it, you can hold on to it, right? You don't have to sell it, but that is not the case here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this would, uh, uh, you know, so this would uh, pretty much take the land out from under uh, uh, people. Uh, again, one thing I should say in this, these uh, joint uh, uh, tenancies, these uh, tenants in common, sometimes this is also known as uh, heirs property. Now, what happens over time is, <clears throat> especially as you get uh, into the 20th century, um, is 
people began to understand what was going on. Uh, speculators, um, corporations, railroad companies, um, uh, speculators and that. And when they began to realize there's a uh, sort of a loophole in this is, so say a family's had this land for generations, I could come in as this corporation, someone else, all I gotta do is find one person in the family who's willing to sell me either their entire share or even a part share of their property. And now that gives me the right to force a sale of everybody's land and take it from them. And this happened frequently. I mean, one example of this is Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, um, which is now a resort area in that. that most of that land was taken from African-Americans through this uh, actions, through these partition sales. Just takes one person to come in, force the sale. Traditionally, um, you know, the courts in England and some in the United States would uh, consider things like, you know, the value of the land to the family, who's owned it for longer, right? Increasingly courts, and still to this day, um, when I was in law school, we were told that 90% of the courts in the US today will default to a partition of sale um, because you could use this simple, seemingly simple economic um, <laughs> sort of calculation. The idea was, well, is the land worth more whole or individually, right? If it's worth more whole, then we're gonna sell the whole thing rather than give it to individual people. So again, I could just come in, um, I could own this land for a single day and not even, so there's no even time limit on how long I have to have this. Well, again, I just gotta find one person who uh, is willing to sell me that share. That person doesn't even have to be occupying the land. They could just be do it through the heir's property. And again, remember how I said, every time the land passes in test date, it just broadens, or every time it, it broadens the uh, class of people who can do this. So over generations, over generations, you can go from, you know, three people who have a claim to it to, you know, dozens of them, if not more. And this creates a uh, significant issue um, in allowing this to sell. <clears throat> um, and so this is going to take land from them uh, over and over. And a lot of times in these um, uh, freedom colonies and others, land uh, is, is was held uh, communally, right? And so this is also going to cause a problem. Later, say you are able to hold on to your land, this makes proving a uh, chain of title, right? Who has clear title to this even more difficult when there are no, um, uh, where it's not registered, there is no uh, you know, uh, uh, will deeding it to someone else. So this is gonna hurt African-Americans later when you get in the 20th century, trying to get uh, farm aid from uh, the federal government, right? They're gonna have, uh, they're gonna be denied many of these loans because they don't have the documentation on hand to be able to apply for some of these, uh, some of these loans and others. Um, and so those are issues there. Um, and then, you know, continuing with this. So one of the arguments I'm making here is this was government policy, right? To give this land away to free. And most of it was, again, to immigrants. And when we're talking about immigrants in this period, we're talking about European immigrants, right? So white immigrants coming in are, are getting free land um, uh, in large amounts of it uh, in the United States to build this wealth, to expand the economy and those and African-Americans are left out of this. Now, again, the wealth gap continues into the 20th century, especially uh, starting with the New Deal and it, even before that, but I'm just gonna focus on those there. Um, many of the laws there, again, even if written race neutrally, meaning again, there's no uh, mention of race in there, it's all about their application and how they're uh, done. Uh, the New Deal was <laughs> uh, created in a way where there was significant local power and local authority over how these aspects of the laws, these federal laws were um, implemented. And this is in many ways, uh, Southern uh, uh, states use this against African-Americans this is during Jim Crow and other um, segregation. They're using that uh, for them. Social Security Act alone right there um, provided the benefits for certain, um, and this was purposeful the way it was written, and this is a uh, Southern influence on it um, and white supremacy uh, influence on it, <clears throat> written to exclude many of the jobs that African-Americans were holding at the time. So they weren't eligible for these uh, benefits there. Um, even the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which during the Great Depression um, paid farmers really to take land out of cultivation and things like that. Uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Gilley pointed out this morning, um, a lot of uh, freed slaves were forced into uh, tenant farming and, and others. And they're they were therefore left out of this. This this money the government was giving was often going to uh, the owners of the land, right? Who the idea was they were supposed to then divide that amongst uh, their tenants, but there was no no requirement for that, and, and many of them just even if there was, they were just going to ignore it. So they lose out there. Um, <clears throat> other things, the GI Bill, which is looked at as one of the um, most important uh, factors in creating a burgeoning, a, a large, large white middle class in the United States, gave very generous educational benefits mortgage benefits and more. Again, even though it didn't specifically exclude African-Americans, its application did. Um, one of them, say just the uh, tuition credits and the education. 
Um, you know, you gotta remember this is a time where it's segregated. African Americans just couldn't go to any university or college they wanted to, so that where their white counterparts could, and you know, whatever college they get into was just gonna accept them. They could use these benefits, uh, move up, uh, you know, and, and go into their careers. Um, African Americans, especially in South and other places, were limited to uh, historically black colleges and universities. Um, there, the issue at the time was even though they had lots of apl applicants for these uh, uh, for education. <laughs> they were not, you know, th these schools were not well funded, so they did not have the space for a lot of people. So that's going to mean they, you know, so they can't just, okay, they didn't get into their first choice, sort of, so to speak. They're going to pick another university there. They're, they're not going to be able to get into that. Even the land grant universities um, that are from the 20th, uh, uh, that are given out uh, by the federal government to create all these state universities and things like that. Um, and many of them were only uh, open to whites uh, from the beginning and by law and from there. Um, even going forward on this, you're going to have federal housing authorities uh, impacting this um, from, uh, for, in one way, um, just openly allowing racially restricted covenants. What that means, a uh, racially restricted covenant, was when you sell the property, you could write into the sales contract that um, this land cannot be sold to any group, right? You can't, uh, so they would have to say this land can't be sold to African Americans or others. Um, that's eventually struck, uh, struck uh, oh, excuse me, struck down um, by the Supreme Court, but. I mean, again, uh, it has to, there are ways around those things. I mean, what that really did was just say, you can't explicitly do this. There are ways around that. So you have a racially restrictive uh, covenant um, that explicitly, implicitly supported by the government uh, and uh, you know, exclude African-Americans. Well, once they take that away, then what you get are these uh, uh, mortgage uh, lending policies, you know, redlining, right? Essentially, they would create red areas on the map and say, we're not going to give uh, uh, mortgages uh, in these areas that were uh, viewed as uh, African-American minority and others. So um, if you could get a loan there, they were offering incredibly high interest rates, uh, predatory um, schemes within them, balloon payments, things like that. That's going to make it even more difficult for these people to move out uh, of the cities, out of other areas. You know, uh, uh, GI Bill and all this really did help create a lot of the suburbs around cities, uh, people moving out, um, and that and African Americans were largely uh, left out of this. So what you get then is all these policies. Um, really where African-Americans have uh, little to no chance uh, of uh, taking part in them. And at each turn, there is uh, a wealth passed down uh, of more and more. And then why is this wealth gap? And now it's so large, right? We said maybe they have 10 to 13% of a white household for every dollar they have. We're on the cusp of and beginning arguably the greatest transfer, generational transfer of wealth in, uh, in history, not just American history, but any history. You have the boomer generation um, that is, as they're uh, uh, passing away, are leaving large amounts of money uh, to their families and large amounts of wealth. They, who, many of them who were either recipients and beneficiaries of the, um, going all the way back to the Homestead Act, or these 20th century uh, wealth building initiatives by the federal government. Um, what was the numbers here? It's something, it's uh, the numbers, the amount of difference uh, between uh, uh, groups here. It's, you know, the average white household has something, a median household has about 30, uh, $330,000 worth of wealth there. African-American uh, median household uh, was less than 100,000. I think it's, I, I lost the notes here, but it's around 40,000, 50,000 there. Um, that's a significant, significant difference uh, to say the least. And so. That is why I say this is not something that can just fix itself, right? This is not, you can't just, um, it, it, it was created by policies, it's perpetuated by policies. It, it's almost unfair to ask people to say, all right, now you just catch up, right? Things are better or, or there's progress made. That's not possible. I mean, that is a significant, significant um, gap that arguably can never be made up there. You know, uh, one of the other things, and one of the last points I wanted to make in here too, is that, so there's uh, Dr. Lee and others works have shown that you know, African Americans still, despite all these obstacles and others, did get you know uh, uh, create businesses, create land uh, wealth generation for them. Even then, even when they overcome all these issues, you have things like the Tulsa massacre and others. Nineteen nineteen, there's over thirty racial racial massacres where uh, uh, communities are massacred, um, the property destroyed, and then later stolen from them, straight up stolen. Like right, they would just uh, usurp it in many ways, and then over time, that just became their legal property. So even where you have a place like Tulsa, where you have, right, what is often known as the uh, Black Wall Street, um, even when you have this great wealth generation, that is then destroyed and taken from them. And, and that way, I mean, it, it, to say they're a disadvantage, I, I don't even think that's a fair enough word, right, a correct word in that is how much um, is taken from them. I mean, we're at, what, 100 years since uh, Tulsa there? And it, I mean, 
not only just trying to rebuild that, and it's been a hundred years and now only the city of Tulsa and others are even starting to, you know, acknowledge what happened and all that. So to say that, you know, that, that oh, that there could have built up wealth in over that time, people could have, done, no, if it takes a hundred years, a century to even acknowledge what happened and say it was wrong in that, just think about how much longer that's going to take to build wealth than that. So, I mean, it is a daunting, daunting challenge. Um, there's uh, some pretty good work out there on this. Uh, the um, Federal Reserve, the St. Louis Fed, and others have been advocating and saying and pointing out that much of this wealth gap was created by government policy. Therefore, the answer is government policy to try to correct these. And that's, uh, as you know, um, is difficult. It takes time. Uh, there's going to be pushback in that. But really, that's where it seems uh, to it. Um, and even with the uh, those, like I said, the uh, partition sales uh, continues to this day. Now, in a lot in Massachusetts, this happens often, but it's a little different. We're talking about like a quarter acre plot with a single household. There, that partition sale kind of more makes sense. You have four people fighting over it. You can't really divide that into four, right? There's one house there, so forcing a sale there uh, would be a thing. One of the other things to talk about with that too, I just wanted to go back to that, is there are ways around that. But it presupposes a lot of things on the uh, part of the owners. What I mean today, if you if you go to a lawyer and you're you're in a uh, a joint tenancy like this, uh, they're going to tell you that's the least stable uh, uh, way to own property, and you need to get out of that. You could either contract around it with the other people, say you know, and really you know create another contract to get rid of those uh, bad things. You could turn it into an LLC, right? Turn it into a little uh, limited liability corporation to try to overcome this. But just think about what's needed to be able to do that. One, it presupposes that you have the money to get a, a attorney, a good attorney who knows what they're doing there, that you know the law, that you have the ability to get to that attorney and all that. Um, and so it is really skewed to those who are um, really have the education and the ability to uh, uh, access these things, which as we know, not everybody has. And again, that lack of wealth over the years meant even less chance to uh, uh, know these things. I mean, again, I'm a I'm an attorney. I do this. When I read some of this stuff, it sounds foreign to me. It's hard enough to understand. That's someone who studied it. So just imagine for someone who uh, doesn't have that education, how are they supposed to navigate that? It's it seemingly, uh, to call it unjust is, I think, kind, right? It, it's more than unjust. It's, it's, it's beyond unfair. But I mean, so um, I don't want to take up all the time. I think I might be going a little further. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Lee now. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks, thanks, John. And thank you, Dr. Guillory and the East Thorough Town Village um, for inviting me to speak on today's panel about um, and celebration of Juneteenth, but also addressing the topic of land, um, intergenerational wealth, and also inequality. Um, so just to repeat, I am Dr. Nietzsche Lee. I am a professor at UMass Boston. Um, I am specifically a archeologist of the African diaspora. And what this means is, is that I focus specifically on the material remains that in particular people of African descent have actually left behind. Um, but it also means in my emphasis on the African diaspora that I am specifically interested in the history of people of African descent following their dispersal throughout the globe and specifically throughout the globe following the transatlantic slave trade. Now I'm being very specific with the time of this in particular because African Africans and literally the people of the continent have had many migrations. It is not just limited to the transatlantic slave trade, even though in discussions of black history, we largely focus on the centrality of that moment. Um, and then we also sort of negate the fact with the emphasis on the transit, transatlantic slave trade that people of African descent and black people have continued to be part of a global sort of like unfolding of history. And so with that, I literally like to sort of explain that I am focusing not only on the transatlantic slave trade as a moment that is significant in black people's history as it relates to the formation not only of racial categories, but specifically with the advent of racism as a significant global phenomenon that ends up having major implications for our society, for our economics, for our politics, but to also acknowledge that there is a dynamism to our history beyond that. And I speak to this dynamism because in my own research, 
I actually focus specifically on the moment of following the abolition, following the formal abolition of slavery in 1865. So what this means is that I'm not only just concerned with the conditions that led up to the emancipation of people of African descent in the United States, but I am also specifically interested in the actual actions that they follow to live as free people. And what this means is not just the acknowledgement of the status. And when I say status, Don, I'm talking specifically about the political status that came with the United States government's recognition of them as citizens with the passage of the 14th Amendment, but specifically the ways in which people of African descent in the US decided to define their own lives as free people, as free people, not just free, but free people, because literally enslavement was a forced condition. Like no one ultimately literally arrived here as slaves in terms of that identity. That was a condition that was enforced on them. Now, one of the reasons why I really am fascinated with the moment of freedom is that it is not only significant symbolically in terms of acknowledging the agency that Black people had in terms of the own self-definition, but it is also a really important point as it relates to reversing how we oftentimes as historians and archeologists come to define the Black experience in terms of how we write about it. We oftentimes think because of the pervasiveness of racism that there's a persistent focus on victimhood. And that's not to negate the sort of all omnipresent constantly sort of happening forms of racial violence that has happened. But it is to acknowledge that no individual perpetually defined themselves in the state of as victim or always in the state of oppressed. That literally people of African descent literally embodied and, try and resisted at all forms, at all points of their lives, and that they individually, independent of the government or other, or other external actors exerted control over their lives to exert control and also to sort of define what it means to be free for them. And one of the reasons why I think that this is really important symbolically, because much of how we think about that which has come to define what is the sort of, not just about what does it mean to be self-possessed, but sort of, and when I say self-possessed, to sort of enact your freedom, to enact your will, came about through sort of notions of following the abolition of slavery, people of African descent, identifying education, identifying land ownership, identifying the ability to raise their own children, to literally to make decisions about not only their children's futures, but about their future in terms of something as simple as when and where they would work and how they would work. The moment following the abolition of slavery, all of that ultimately really sort of became a really defining point. And a defining point in the sense that it was literally punctuated by the nonstop will of African-Americans to do whatever they needed to do to minimize any form of dependence on their former white enslavers. As a result of that in my work, I focus on land ownership. And as we think about the moment of Juneteenth and we remember the holiday of Juneteenth as being a sort of acknowledgement, number one of the delayed process of, eman of emancipation for African-Americans, but specifically the delayed process of emancipation for African-Americans who were actually enslaved in Texas. And Texas is a very fascinating place to think about not just freedom, but to think about the significance of land as it relates to exercising black freedom. And I wanna say black in this case as a form of politics, as a form of recognizing that despite oppression, that there is power and resistance that um, ultimately defines sort of like their lives and experience. That Texas, despite having one of the smallest populations of enslaved Black people, and despite the state's formal and sort of like when Texas was annexed as part of the United States, 
the one thing that was adamant or important to that was the significance of slavery to their economic and also their sort of like survival as a state. And so when we talk about the delayed emancipation that took place in Texas, one of the things that stands out about the ways in which Black people grasp and reach for their freedom is that the state saw the highest rise in rates of Black land ownership in contrast to any other Southern state that was part of the Confederacy. Now, this is really significant when you think about Dr. Diffie's discussion about the Homestead Act and literally the actual legal obstacles. And also we can probably see structural obstacles in terms of a uh, almost sort of like limited to no access to education, to sort of like formal forms of um, capital and economic capital through banks or even through the Freedmen's Bureau that people Black people in Texas were able through their own means, whether it was starting off sharecropping and saving their own money to actually buy land, whether it was ultimately through the establishment or at least the sort of further time, like nurturing of relationships with either former white enslavers or other sort of like uh, benefactors, they were able to buy their own land and literally the rates of land ownership in the state exceeded that in other actual in, in other areas of the former Confederacy. So in my work, I like to actually sort of not only focus on that, but to think about this almost as a paradox in terms of how we think about freedom. And it's a paradox in the sense that the ownership of land was critical to the actual physical process of minimizing one's dependence on whites. It ultimately allowed for people to be to feed themselves, to feed their children. It allowed for individuals to have something that could be passed down across generations. So at no matter, no matter what, that there was always a sense of not just home, but something that you could invest in both symbolically in terms of how you thought about home, but also economically. Um, people would oftentimes mortgage, even within each other, their land to each other as a way to actually liquidate money so they can actually spend it and access other sort of like resources to till their land because you know they couldn't access it through the banks. We oftentimes see in, in, in various oral histories and even in the archival record where people, black people who own property talked with great pride about being self-sufficient, about the process of oftentimes other like forming communities freedom communities, freedmen communities, where there were multiple property owners who would not only sort of own their land, but would also establish their own churches, their own schools to educate their children. And so what we actually see oftentimes through land ownership was also the ability for Black people to meet their day-to-day -day needs to survive in U.S. society. However, the paradox that exists with this is, is that even as individuals were working to grasp their own freedom, as Dr. Diffley actually pointed out, is that there is still legal structures that actually make this impossible. And what I say impossible means is that it does not ever allow for land ownership to be to ultimately to accumulate the economic capital that is sufficient to allow for the, a, a major advantage in US society. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is, is that we oftentimes see black landowners literally occupying some of the most unproductive or the smallest parcels of land um, in particular areas. We actually see, even with the establishment of you know, various gardens to allow for their own subsistence, that people are still having to labor on the land of white large landowners or former, or even sometimes their former enslavers, because they don't have the uh, land that is actually fertile enough to actually sustain large agricultural sort of like holdings to establish a more commercialized sort of, you know, kind of business. 
what we're seeing is, is that even despite the, you know, ability to create and to construct a home, that children are ultimately having to go to cities, not only to work, but to actually get an education at a high school level. And so ultimate, and, and also, if you're also seeing that even when land, land, Black landholders are able to gain success to even maybe it is to actually accumulate large parcels so parcels beyond sort of the standard 10 to 40 acres being able to establish successful you know agricultural operations that can compete with local whites that literally the um sort of backlash from envious whites who are angry about the sort of economic mobility and socio social mobility of free blacks that it ends up triggering very violent backlash we talk about this in terms of Tulsa, but even on sort of the smallest scales, when we think about lynching, lynching was oftentimes the result of envious or white of an economic, of a black person who had economic success, who dared to defy what was considered to be their place or their sort of right place in Southern society. And so what we see is, is that there's a paradox even with land ownership, where it oftentimes allows free men and free women to step into a form of freedom, but to also never fully sort of like ever grasp the promises that were actually laid out in terms of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I'll just conclude in terms of talking about why this is actually really important. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why it is important for us to think about the sort of historical antecedents as we talk about not just the meaning of Juneteenth, but even the persistent question about how do we begin to close the wealth gap between blacks and whites? How do we begin to also to, to do this, not just sort of uh, through structural adjustments in terms of a radical sort of like engagement or break with how our law has formally actually sort of set up policies that normalize this, but it is to also sort of begin to think about number one or to make space for the meanings beyond the ways in which the United States notions of citizenship or ownership have defined freedom and to make room for the ways in which people of African descent have also defined that. And to think about even as we are looking to modify economic and political structures to support black freedom, that the work can't stop there, that there still has to be an ideological adjustment in terms of that to make room for a full expression of an extension of equality. And so I'll conclude there. Thank you both, um, John and Nidra for your incredible presentations. Um, that went exactly the way I thought it would go. Uh, you all are so brilliant. Um, and from your respective disciplines, you provided a great deal of insight on the way in which this theme um, with which um, we are um, wrestling, right, um, has implications for not just the moment at the time on the ground, but also for the present day. <clears throat> Um, we're going to do a Q&A. Um, let me assess the chat. If you have any questions, please feel free to, um, to, to include them there in the chat. Um, I want to open this up with one of the, uh, with a question for each of the, um, for each of the panelists. Uh, and I'll start with uh, John Diffley. Um, so with re regarding the information you, you presented, John, um, in light of that history, uh, how does an evaluation of something like home equity accumulation over time, especially in the current housing market, contribute to the increasing wealth gap? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, it only just builds it even further. I mean, it, it, it draws it out even further. Um, you know, look at this. You could either pass the, the house down to someone in the family that you could sell it. And that. that's, you know, for today, I mean, there are houses. I think I, um, I was talking to Anthony about this, the housing market. My family sent me something. They uh, live on uh, Long Island. Um, they showed a house 
It was burned to the foundation. It went for 400K. I mean, I mean literally, the foundation went for $400,000. Just think about how much money that is. That can then just be what you could do with that. I mean, so you don't, a lot of times this, this uh, wealth, that's this home equity, is not just passed down to one generation, but allows people to pass it down to the second generation after that. So this just compounds it even further, um, the home equity. And if you haven't had the opportunity to uh, build this up, um, it's it's just that much harder. I mean, uh, you know, this one of the percent uh, from the um, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, has these uh, the consumer uh, index or it's consumer. Um, it's I, I've lost the name of it here. Sorry. Um, who looks at what the uh, how consumers uh, view this? Oh, survey of consumer finances and things like that. What they found is percentages of let's just uh, look at this. Who are millionaires? And often this comes from uh, you know from home equity, from being able to pass this on, from our retirement accounts and things like that. Um, white families, fifteen percent are millionaires and, and can pass that down. Uh, African American families, two percent. Uh, uh, Latino families, three uh, percent. What's even more stark is when you look at the percentage of negative wealth and negative um, uh, uh, here, which essentially is debt. Uh, black families in America, African-American families, 18% are in uh, debt, right? So what are they passing on there? It's not that equity, it's not the home equity, it's more debt. So that's, right, so you have the exact opposite where you have one group say, who's able to pass wealth on and build in and build and build. The other one who's passing on debt, which is gonna lower and lower and lower and, and, and you know take away the uh, chances that. Uh, uh, so that's African American uh, families, eighteen percent. Uh, white family, eight percent. Right, that's a, that's a pretty significant gap there, uh, in all that. And so, and I think in the uh, current housing market where things are going insane, um, it's just going to go even further. I, you know, especially as where these a lot of these uh, houses, um, you know, with the COVID made people flee the cities, look for the suburbs and things like that. Well, these are exactly those redlined areas that we were talking about before. So now um, it's even harder to get into. So now people, if they do move out there, they're facing astronomical um, uh, 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 prices. Um, one of the things too I've been reading about is that they've uh, to get a mortgage, uh, you need like exceptional credit right now to get a mortgage that isn't um, you're just going to crush you in that. And again. Where, how are you able to get that uh, that good credit score and all that? Well, again, that is often comes from this wealth that came before and has passed down. So this is just, again, it just compounds it, uh, really does. It's like every generation this passes on, it's gonna get worse unless there is something, at least is my view and I think others, uh, comes, unless something is done, um, it, again, as I said earlier, it's not something that's just gonna fix itself and this is just gonna make it, make it worse and worse. Cool. Thank you so much, John, I appreciate that. Great response. So, uh, Nidra, I have a question for you. Um, so, you know, this being the 150 year, year uh, commemoration of Tulsa, uh, there's a lot of discourse uh, flowing around, especially on social media, uh, where in which you see this privileging of economic development as the route towards Black self determination, almost to the exclusion, if not the actual exclusion, of a discourse surrounding. Uh, political, uh, you know, the advancement in you know political mobilization, um, securing the vote, uh, and, and what have you. Um, do you think it's possible to discuss economic development separate and apart from um, increasing uh, political rights um, as a route or as a means of uh, achieving self black self determination? And uh, why or why not? I think that's a, I think that's a great question. Question, and, and I would personally answer. No to that. Um, the two have to operate um, in tandem together. And the reason why is exactly what John actually laid out earlier. Um, one of the things when we see this is that one of the greatest threats to the actual accumulation of Black wealth and the ability to ultimately develop it. And it's not that I'm not saying that there aren't ways in which it ultimately has been done successfully for Black people, specifically in segregated context. I would say that's like we have, history has shown us that. It is actually the question of the presence of the segregated context. A segregated context does not ever allow for the actual, um, it does not allow for the safeguarding, number one, of any of the economic gains that people of African descent have, and it does not allow for the safeguarding for the further investment of it in ways that will allow for a long-term protection of 
in meeting of Black needs and rights. So I always sort of posit that economic and political rights have to go together. You need political rights as a way to protect the ability to develop. And I mean, in, in the case of the United States, there always have been, they work in tandem. You know, when we think about freedom and specifically think about freedom within this sort of capitalist system, the ability to ultimately to market, trade, earn, and all of that comes with the, also the right to do it with the protection of some form of government. Now, I will ultimately go as far to say that I think that when we see conversations about Black economic, Black self-determination, and specifically it being one rooted in economic development, I don't think that we should think about this sort of like the idea of a sort of distancing from political rights as one that says we don't want any kind of political rights. I think it is a sort of disillusionment with the way in which the political discourse in this country, so the ways in which freedom and democracy have ultimately been promised mm -hmm. and yet have never been fulfilled towards people of African descent, you know? And so, you know, in many ways, you can have all the money in the world but if you can't ultimately exercise the basic right as it relates to a citizen in terms of being able to have protection from the law, all right? If you can't ultimately go into the bank to secure capital. So those are things that don't allow for that. So I think that, that really in many ways, there has to be a sort of almost a construction of a new form of how we think about political rights and what does that mean as it relates to its extension in the United States. Awesome, awesome, thank you so much. <clears throat> um, is there any other questions? Comments? I, I want to add one thing too about the uh, partition sale. Something I found too on this, which uh, um, spread is there. There has been some attempts to try to fix this um, and, and to outlaw this today. But again, the damage has already been done. But it's important to notice um, <laughs> what you start to get is um, these heirs property act, uniform partition of heirs property acts uh, started first in South Carolina. Uh, interestingly, under Governor Haley at the time, uh, Texas has it too now. Uh, Abbott um, uh, uh, signed it into law, and so now they're trying to do it. But again. While this is an attempt to rectify those past things, it doesn't get any of the land back, it doesn't get any of that wealth back there, but it is at least an attempt. Um, the uh, American Bar Association and others have been pushing for that for a long time. So there is some attempts. I meant to throw that in there earlier, but even then, like I said, it, it doesn't bring any of that wealth back, unfortunately. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, that helps a great deal. <clears throat> Okay, well, I want to thank our panelists. Um, I um, I really appreciate um, the 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 one-two punch uh, knockout that you all provided uh, from your <laughs> respective um, uh, disciplines, showing that uh, there are um, <clears throat> unique um, implications uh, from uh, your respective disciplines, but you also um, provide you know um, ways to understand the, uh, the 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 overlap the areas of overlap oh hey here's a question uh, Christian Smith asked what are your pers your respective uh, perspectives on reparations go ahead Nisha. I, uh, yeah go ahead uh, well I mean I, I'm 100 percent for reparations. And I definitely think that reparations needs to come also in the form of a monetary sort of monetary allocation to people of African descent. Um, but I also am in favor of it actually coming with some form of a political and social program that also allows for a structural sort of like ability to uh, level the field. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, I think it's it's 100% necessary. And I would even go as far to say that the reparation needs to go beyond sort of, you know, a just the sort of the distribution as a way of redress of some type of resource as a redress, that there has to be some level of, and when I use the word radical, I mean something that has been totally different and in, in, from what we've ever seen before, but a radical break in which how we as a nation conceptualize 
how we think about not just equity, but also how we conceptualize what does it mean to belong? And how is it that we also think about the role that the government has to play in terms of righting wrongs for people who have been exploited? And fundamentally, where their exploitation has been a fundamental part of the history of this country. So I would like to see reparations and I would like to see that also being included in the conversation about that. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what uh, Dr. Lee said there. Um, it, it, there definitely do. Um, I think a lot of what we're talking about, uh, you know, just just looking at the land that came from the Homestead Act that people were unable to get or was taken from them, that'd be giving equivalent of, of uh, if you gave to a family today about anywhere from uh, half a million to a million dollars uh, giving uh, back. And then that's that's a pittance, many would argue, of what is actually due. But as uh, Dr. Lee pointed out, the money's not enough there, too. So you might have all the money in the world, as you said, but you can't go and use it and, and form this capital. There needs to be be uh, greater changes. And um, I've seen some economists arguing and others that that, you know, to uh, in terms of the wealth gap, this is one of the ways to do it is there needs to be these massive changes, uh, different ways of, uh, of doing this. Um, the money is one thing, but that's not just going to be enough. Um, and, and there should be more, uh, you know, some of the uh, in the farm area, uh, they uh, with the last um, uh, stimulus or recovery bills. Um, uh, many of the, much of the money was earmarked to African American farmers who had been uh, denied this and there. And even there, if you look at the amount of money that was actually given, it's it's a fraction. It's so minute of there. And so some even said, "Oh, that's a form of rep." No, that's not reparations. That that's not it. That's just that, that's something that should have been done all along. And so that that's not even there. That that's not even a drop in the bu bucket, so to speak. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a great question. One of the, the fundamental challenges, I think, to the ongoing conversation about reparations, and I say ongoing because even following the abolition of slavery, there were literally people of African descent who were writing and ultimately engaging even with the law as a way to ask for redress and monetary redress. Um, but I think one of the fundamental challenges that has to sort of be thought about is is number one is not just through the sort of pro the formal process of documenting an injury. You know, so when we think about the emphasis on Tulsa, so much effort has been placed in this idea of how do we quantify the wrong, right? And even when we think about, you know, Dr. Diffie's presentation, I mean, we can definitely through the sort of like assessment of, okay, well, here is what the Homestead Act did and how we can trace literally sort of the ways in which wealth ultimately, like in which black people were unable to accumulate wealth through the denial of participations like that. However, there's also another fundamental challenge to how we think about sort of the formal documentation of redress. And that is the fact that people of African descent were never formally acknowledged as humans follow, like before they were emancipated. And so when we talk about the things that we need to identify a sort of injurious wrong, Right? Like it's not just sort of through, okay, how many sort of instances of lynching do we ultimately can we find? How many instances of actual sort of like quantifiable sort of properties that were destroyed can we find? But it's also thinking about the sort of injury that happened literally at the sort of initial moment of denying people humanity. And in this country, the denial of humanity by even denying them recognition as an individual precluded them from any kind of participation. So even in forms where you cannot directly prove a wrong, there is a wrong, there is an injury. And that continues to be, I think, a fundamental challenge, which is why I say the conversation about reparation has to go beyond just sort of thinking about the sort of actual distribution of some type of tangible resource, but it has to sort of also think about the way in which we are conceptualizing both in the past, but even thinking about it, even now in the present, individuals who have been fundamentally sort of marked as being exploitable bodies. Like that's a, of a significant part of it. And if we can't figure that out, you know, I think that we even saw this with, you know, when pres the former President Obama was talking about reparations and he talked about the fact that as a former constitutional le like legal scholar that he knew that we needed it, but he just couldn't see how through that framework? Well, that's the frame. That's the that's the first paradox that we have to think about. The injury starts with the denial of humanity, and so much else follows with it. You talk some of that the denial of humanity there. 
uh, some of the early issues in the 20th century with lack of birth certificates, just to be able to, that, to file those claims and just to get those started. I mean, that's an ultimate uh, of a denial of humanity, right? They're, they're not getting those there. I mean, so that that is, yeah, and that's, sorry, just that's something that popped in my head there. I mean, that even there, just even if you try to file the legal claims, you're already, you know, you, you can't even get into the court. You can't even uh, put that in there without those and documents. I, that were and I will even say that this is why I think, you know, and I know that our time is coming up, why I think it is really important, even in the moment as we think about slavery, right? Like it's like, we'll never, like the moment of recognizing the sort of violence that enslavement did to people of African descent, we can never forget that. But there is important to also recognize that the moment following the formal abolition of enslavement equally came with the level of violence towards people of African descent that continue to have ramifications. So even as the 14th Amendment says that you're citizens and something as simple as like, okay, your marriage can be recognized, but what about like a birth certificate? The birth certificate is literally the acknowledgement of for even for children of your citizenship. So, you know, these are things that like become part of, you know, they, they talk about it as the afterlife of slavery, right? And so it's just something that we have to still think about. And I think even continue to ponder, not just as we think about sort of like Juneteenth, right? But also like, when, once again, like these are the things that we continue to grapple with when we think about these histories. Awesome, thank you both. All right, and thank you, Christian, for your question. Um, I, we have run out of time, um, but uh, again, thank you uh, for those who uh, presented it, but also thank you for those who uh, who tuned in. Um, yeah, this was this was incredible. Like I said, it was it was everything I thought it would be. So uh, uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, to you all. Um, again, thank you for all the wonderful panelists and also all of you at home who are zooming in. Thank you for participating today. Um, if you have any other questions following this panel, um, please email us at storo at the .com and we can direct your questions to the appropriate parties. Um, once again, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, please feel to come by the village at any point um, and follow us on social media for any future events. Have a good one.